Hello, everybody. Welcome to the opening episode of the Rethinking Resources podcast brought to you by OMV. I'm your host, Steve Shade, an independent radio journalist that will be taking you inside the biggest challenges we are facing in the climate change transformation. Our main topic this first season is the circular economy, a hugely exciting concept full of promise and a genuine source of hope for the future. This is an enlightened departure from the linear system of make, use, and throw away. This first episode will allow us to talk about what the circular economy is and set the stage for upcoming episodes. So, what are we talking about when we talk about the circular economy? In a nutshell, it's a model of production and consumption that involves using existing materials as long as possible and extending the life cycle of products and reducing waste to a minimum. To tell us all about the circular economy, we are joined by Francesca Siciliano Stevens, the managing director of Europen, the European Organization for Packaging and the Environment. Europen is a nonprofit which aims to improve the environmental performance of packaging and packaged products all along the supply chain. So, the circular economy is at the heart of its existence. Francesca, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve. So Francesca, before we talk about why the circular economy is so important and why it is so crucial to get it right, please give our audience an example of, that clarifies what the circular economy is. Sure, and a um, pleasure to be with you here today to discuss this very important uh, uh, topic. Uh, well, I guess um, in order to understand what circular economy is, uh, uh, the best example that uh, we can use is really uh, nature and the natural ecosystem. So if you think of how natural ecosystem work, uh, nothing is wasted, uh, everything is utilized, everything comes back into the circle. And when we apply that concept uh, to our modern lives and our modern economies, uh, that's exactly the same principle. So departing from a linear um, way of living where we basically uh, produce, consume and then discard uh, to the same concept of a circular uh, modeling. So closing the loop essentially and making sure that nothing goes to waste or that waste is really minimized. Um, if I think perhaps something that we might all be able to relate to, to a certain extent, in most countries uh, you will have uh, something called deposit return schemes for uh, beverage bottles. Uh, and that means that you go to the supermarket, uh, you buy, let's say, a beer bottle, uh, you, you drink it and you take it back to the supermarket. And initially when you pay for it, you pay also a deposit. And that, uh, when you take it back to the supermarket, uh, you get the deposit back, so you get this initial money that you put forward back, and that, uh, that the bottles come back into the system. Okay, so the bottle example is, is one that we all know, we can all relate to, and we'll be talking about other examples all throughout the industry and all along the supply chain that, uh, that we can emulate to adopt and adapt uh, circularity into the system, but let's talk about why it is so important to achieve circularity. Well, I guess it's also kind of straightforward if you think about it. Uh, the resources of the planet uh, are not infinite. So I think it's clear that we kind of sustain and continue to live in the way we have been living up to today. Um, there is, uh, we're essentially overshooting the resource of the planet uh, and uh, for a few years now there is this overshoot, Earth Overshoot Day, uh, which basically tells us uh, by when uh, we have already essentially used all the resources available to us for a certain year. And if I'm not mistaken, this year, this, uh, this day happens to be already uh, July uh, 28th, so it's always uh, more or less halfway through the year and the fact that the date is always moving a little bit earlier in the year. Uh, that's just to say that you know we, we need uh, to do to change uh, the model. Uh, we need to find a more sustainable way of living and for our economies to work. You mentioned uh, this important word that we'll be touching on again and again, finite. So let's build a bridge between the what and the why. Uh, the adventurer, Ellen MacArthur, is a major inspiration and proponent of the circular economy. Uh, her personal epiphany came when she sailed solo around the world. And at one point on her voyage, she realized that her small boat was her entire world when she was out at sea. So 
her her realization was that when she's on this boat, her resources were finite. And then carrying that on, she thought, okay, so there's my boat, and then there's the planet I live on, and there is no planet B. She created this foundation when she finished her voyage, and that foundation defines the circular economy as being based on three principles driven by design, and I'll, I'll, I'll name them. The principles are eliminate waste and pollution, circulate products and materials at their highest value, and regenerate nature. So eliminate, circulate, regenerate. Uh, does that sum it up effectively for you? Yes, very much so, absolutely. And if you think about it, uh, really reducing uh, uh, the initial, let's say, impacts of utilization of resources uh, in the first place uh, is really the first step into this chain, right? It's the most important uh, initial step to take. Uh, and this is why when you think of product, uh, the design of the product is so important. Uh, so um, it's been estimated that uh, we uh, can basically 80% uh, uh, of uh, reducing the impact uh, uh, comes from the design. So this huge impact, uh, that positive impact that can come by improving the design of a product uh, is kind of designing waste out of the product uh, to make it more reusable, but also more recyclable. Um, but we should also, I think, not forget um, that circular economy is not a goal in itself. So the goal is to reduce the environmental and uh, uh, environmental footprint, but also the climate footprint, so climate emissions. So that's the end goal. And circular economy is an instrument that should take us there. Um, so I think that's important to take into consideration when then we need to figure out what are the instruments that we need to deploy to move towards the, this goal. Uh, if I take the example of uh, um, reuse, uh, which is also very uh, important and very high on the agenda, political agenda at the moment, it's something we, again, we need to improve and increase. But let's not forget, again, you go back to the example of packaging, which is the one I know best, uh, ultimately, you can reuse things indefinitely, right? Ultimately, they will also come to the end of their life and be discarded. Uh, uh, in the case of packaging, it will depend on the type of packaging material, for example, how many cycles uh, you can do. Uh, and that's why it's also so important and that we don't forget the recycling, how important recycling is, because ultimately, even reusable products, you will be, have to be able to recycle them in order to bring the material back into the loop. So the three parts are really uh, all very important. Okay, and I'll come back to you for some specific examples of, of how packaging can have another life as, say, a car bumper or things like that. I really want to get into some examples, but... Francesca, let's talk about you specifically for a second and your role in the circular economy as a representative of Europen. Um, so your credibility is on the line, Francesca. How do we know that you're an honest broker, uh, not a lobbyist, uh, leading us around in circles on the circular economy, so to say, on behalf of the industry? Well, um, so basically, let me tell you a few words about uh, who European is and our members. So our members represent the entire packaging uh, supply chain, I would say value chain, because there is lots of value attached to all of the materials and the products that, uh, that are packaged. So really, our members go from the production of the packaging raw material uh, to the placing of the packaged products on the market, so the full loop. Um, and we as an organization have sensed really the importance of advancing packaging sustainability, uh, not today or yesterday, but we were set up uh, just 30 years ago, in fact, uh, next year is our 30th anniversary, which I think is in itself a testament of the fact that, you know, it is a big commitment for us linking packaging and sustainability. And if you look, most of our members, if not all, have already, in fact, adopted and announced uh, goals which are already uh, more ambitious than the one we're discussing currently at political level. Uh, so the, their reputation is very much on the line. If you think also that many of those uh, members uh, are, are brands, uh, so really with the direct interaction with the, with the customers. Um, and uh, what is important uh, and what we're trying to bring to the debate uh, is also concrete solutions. So we support incredibly high level of ambition uh, uh, in the legislative uh, uh, changes that are being discussed currently at European level, but they also have to be enforceable and implementable so that they are not just on paper. 
Okay, so European focus is on packaging and the environment. Uh, and when we're talking about packaging, we're talking mostly about plastic packaging. So let me put some big numbers out there, and then I will ask you to put them into context. Uh, according to Plastics Europe, around 55 million tons of plastic were produced by European companies in the year 2020. Uh, out of all that plastic, how much actually goes into packaging? Um, yes, yeah, so the amount that goes into packaging is about 40%. Uh, and then the rest uh, will be going to other sectors, uh, like about 20% to building and constructions and 10% also in, uh, into automotive. Okay, and of those numbers, so we've got 40% going into packaging, 20 into building construction, 10% into automotive. Um, how much of that is brought into the circular economy? So how much packaging would go into becoming a car bumper? How much is, it can, can be recycled, upcycled? Yes, well, the, the numbers really differentiate per material. And perhaps if you allow me also, I'd just like to, to get some numbers straight because, uh, you know, when, uh, when, you, uh, when you pose your first questions about the numbers uh, uh, around plastics, uh, certainly plastic has a relevant uh, uh, place uh, in packaging because of its uh, um, flexibility and its lightweight. Uh, but then if you look at the figures, and these are Eurostat data uh, from the peers 2009-2019, uh, you also see that uh, actually the reality is, is a little bit different as a paper and cardboard uh, uh, is actually the main uh, packaging waste material in the EU. 40% um, of the total uh, followed by plastic and glass more or less at the same, uh, the same level with 19% uh, more or less each. Uh, then wood uh, and then metal. Uh, so the, I'd just like to underline that because I think it's important that we do not uh, demonize any materials. Uh, and as European, you know, material neutrality for us is very important. We represent all of the packaging materials. Um, we clearly have seen what has happened over the last, uh, you know, few years in terms of uh, the increased uh, attention specifically towards plastics. But it's important that you know we take a step back in the sense that uh, we need to assess what's the best solution in terms of packaging solution depending on the product. Uh, and so uh, dictating, let's say, that one material over the other, you know, necessarily uh, is the best option because that doesn't allow us then to have a full assessment of the environmental impact uh, and also serving, let's say, the product, best protecting the product, which is ultimately uh, the, role, uh, uh, the role of packaging. Uh, um, and a few years back, uh, if you think what happened, you know, through uh, some legislative changes, lots of focus was put essentially on the weight of the packaging. So how do we reduce the weight of the packaging, make packaging lighter, which actually was was a big uh, um, element that determined a big uh, move, let's say, towards flexible packaging, and therefore increased plastic packaging. And then we realized, you know, there were some more difficulties at the level of recycling uh, with a certain type of plastics packaging, and how do we solve the problem. And now, actually, through innovation, uh, we're also able uh, to uh, recycle, harder to recycle packaging, uh, and, and that's a big step change. Uh, so it's just important, you know, when we take a decision, the legislator takes decision that all these different elements are assessed to avoid that uh, we just uh, move from one issue to the other without really or even creating a bigger environmental problem if we're not careful. Um, I have here a recent snapshot. Uh, so let's look at the, the circularity report card for the year 2020. Uh, again, according to Plastics Europe, 23% of plastics still ended up in landfills. Uh, over 40% went to energy recovery, which I guess means it, it was incinerated. 35% of plastics in Europe were recycled. So that's a big improvement, but of course there's still a long way to go to reach circularity, right? Uh, there is clearly progress uh, that has happened. And so, uh, you know, clearly recycling is moving forward for all materials. So. Uh, and again, the numbers will differentiate uh, according to the materials. And it's also important that we do have legislation set at a European level that defines uh, recycling targets uh, uh, per materials. So, um, what I think is very positive and important is that we have seen uh, an increase in you know, a sense of direct ownership of the issue. 
uh, in this case, uh, um, uh, to answer your question, from the part of the plastics industry. Uh, so they really have put their hands up and say, you know, this is, uh, uh, we're going to do this, we're going uh, to, you know, make everything uh, that it's uh, on our part uh, and we need to do more. Um, I think that's also true for all the other materials. Uh, so it's not just you know, for plastics, uh, even those that uh, already have high rates of recycling, for example, metal uh, uh, packaging are committed to do, uh, to continue to do even better. Uh, there, the reason is also quite straightforward. Ultimately, waste has value, right? So if we talk about this circle of circular economy, uh, things have to come back. Why do they come back? Because they actually have value. And uh, this is really, I think, the beauty of um, of circular economy and what ultimately uh, will determine its, its success. Um, uh, this is also why I think uh, we as Europeans uh, really are advocating for uh, waste to start to be seen as a valuable secondary raw material. Uh, so um, we want to see this material back, uh, coming back into the value chain. Uh, and uh, um, we know that without this, so without this, you know, closing the loop, we will not be able to meet uh, uh, environmental and climate targets. So, so that's really at the core of it, uh, of this effort. Yeah. Let's also talk about the philosophy behind the core of it. The, the promise of the circular economy is that the economy can continue to grow, but not at the cost of destroying our planet not destroying life as we know it. So is this an achievable goal? Can we have the best of both worlds? Uh, yes. I am a big believer of the fact that, uh, um, yes, I don't think that the only way to protect our planet and our life on the planet is to go backwards and stop growing. In fact, I'm quite concerned when, uh, when I started to hear this uh, concept of floating. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, the best way to achieve a sustainable growth, so we're talking about sustainable growth, is if we really adopt a systemic approach uh, to change. And uh, what, do, what do I mean by this? So change really cannot achieve by just means of slogan or targets, uh, right? So, so if you just say, okay, we need to recycle by X percent, we need to reuse by X percent, you do need targets uh, to set the direction of travel. But how do we get there? And to get there, um, again, big responsibilities on the side of industry. We discussed before packaging design, making sure that what the product are designed the way they can go back uh, into the loop. Uh, but we also need to make sure, for example, that uh, we have the infrastructures to support the change. And, and that's uh, a big issue. So um, we, we need also to have um, you know, if you think about a collection of waste, a sorting of waste, recycling of waste, that the infrastructure is where it all starts. Uh, but then we also have really um, citizen awareness, uh, which is very important because citizens need to participate in the change as consumer, of course. Uh, if I give you an example about uh, uh, packaging again um, and reuse specifically, uh, many of our members are engaged in uh, uh, reuse uh, pilot projects. Uh, and the question, and these are very important, right, because they kind of allow you to assess what is that we need it uh, to scale it up. Because the pilot is good, but then if you're really talking about delivery change, this has to become the norm, right? So it has to be scaled up at the level of the large distribution, for example. Um, so we also need to assess what is that works beyond the traditional, for example, large urban context, right? The city center, uh, what works for certain households because the needs are different as well. Single households, higher income households. How do we address, you know, the different needs of the consumers as well? So. That's what I'm talking about systemic change. It's not just about you know adopting the target, that's the first step, but then how do we get there is the, the way we can make it successful. Okay, let's continue on this this, this elegant path of logic uh, and, and talk about what it means for all of us and the way we live our lives. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle means uh, significant changes in behavior for all of us, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I would say it's really clear that you know, we can achieve the transition to a circular economy uh, without an effort really from all of us uh, and including indeed, you know, us as citizens and, and consumer. 
um, uh, if I think, uh, you know, packaging in particular, again, the role of consumer is so fundamental uh, because if you think about it, you know, the packaging hands at home uh, is not a big goods, it's quite small, easy to dispose. Uh, how do we make sure that we bring it back, the packaging waste into the value chain? Uh, so we need to give the consumers the right tool uh, to empower them, right, in helping moving uh, towards a circular economy. Uh, we need to give them, I would say, the right information to start with uh, and also the right tools. We need to still, you know, ensure that there is convenience, right? Because when something becomes too complex and, and burdensome, then it's easy to put people off. Um, again, a very practical example, what we've done as an industry together with many other industry uh, partners, uh, we have identified that one issue is information on the packaging, on how to properly you know, sort your waste, which means in which bin am I going to put this piece of packaging, right? which is the right bin. And sometimes it's not so straightforward. Um, and in particular, we see that at a national level, each country comes up with its own ideas on how you know, to inform citizens. And this is creating even bigger issues because sometimes you find on pack multiple information, even if they don't relate to your country. So we have proposed a harmonized system to be introduced at the European level. So have the same information in all European countries on pack which then can still be adapted depending on the color of the bee, which of course are still different in every different country, but at least give the initial information like this is this material that you know can go into your uh, the correct bin and, uh, and you know where to put it. So it sounds like it's quite basic, but actually it's really important because one of the reasons you don't get material back is, you know, if this first step in the process is not done correctly. What else can we, as citizens and consumers, actually do? Uh, what changes in the way we live our day-to-day -day lives um, are most effective? Well, day-to-day -day change is clearly right. Uh, um, and being more aware, I think there is already an increased level of, of greater awareness. But again, if I can be very, very selfish here when it comes to packaging, uh, please put the packaging in, in the right bin bag so we, we get the material back. Uh, but jokes apart, I think uh, it clearly the consumer has an important role to play um, uh, in making sure that you know he participates in this collective effort. But it's also on the part of think of us, of industry, and on the authorities to help the consumers uh, concretely uh, with their choices, uh, how to make you know better choices, more informed choices. Uh, uh, providing them with the right information that they need. I just gave you the example of the label, but also making the information more easy accessible. Um, uh, that's also digital is something that is coming in handy and uh, uh, more and more we see uh, also the use of digital uh, uh, tools uh, to help the consumer accessing this information, which is very good. Uh, but very practical as well, if you think, you know, uh, someone living in a relatively small apartment, uh, there is also an issue of space. So how do we then help, you know, uh, and again, we are looking back particularly at the um, uh, municipalities, how do we help make sure that we give the citizen the best way to help them? You know, if they want to do the right thing and sort the waste correctly at home, um, is then storing in a home the best solution when, you know, it's a small apartment blocks or another one? And again, it, there is no one solution, right? That's really to be adapted to make sure that we help people uh, accomplish the change rather than uh, create more resistance. Uh, let's go back to the digital example, and then I want to ask you for another one. The digital example would would be something that um, somebody could scan with their smartphone, and then they would get instructions on how exactly to dispose of it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there are already some trial, uh, uh, indeed. Uh, and uh, the beauty of that, that you can also then choose in which country you are. And, and therefore, let's say you're traveling, right? Uh, uh, you know, and that's an issue I think many of us have been confronted with when on holiday we don't know anymore <laughs> where to put the, bin, the waste, which is the right bin. Uh, so that's really helpful indeed. You can scan it, could be a QR code or another type of, you know, digital, uh, digital mean. Um, and that's also something more broadly uh, that um, digital is coming in helpful in, 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 two, in two aspects. So one, uh, there is currently also a proposal uh, from the European Commission for eco-design legislation. 
um, which uh, really looks into introducing this concept of uh, reusability, reliability, and recyclability of products. Uh, and as part of this proposal, they're also considering the introduction of a digital product passport. Uh, essentially, again, you know, a QR code or a digital uh, uh, tool that um, will allow, um, and not just the consumers, so different parts of the value chain as well, to have access uh, to the information that they need. Because, of course, if you are in a business, right, you just need access to certain type of information that are irrelevant for the consumer. The consumer will need different type of information. Uh, the beauty of that for us, also looking at it from a packaging industry perspective, is that we will uh, reduce the need of space on the pack because that's often also a need for more packaging. Uh, for certain products uh, that are hard, heavily regulated, you, by law you need to provide you know, a lot of information on the packaging. So the use of digital means will also help that. Which it's, it's, it's a great example. I mean, I don't want to stray too far in this direction, but I'm just thinking as a recent example that showed it really works is um, traveling during the COVID pandemic and the QR codes that were being generated every time we cross borders and the information was accessible within minutes and it worked. Um, so I'm just saying that the digital technology really has been proven. And if now we can reward people who want to do the right thing in terms of separating waste and, and, and putting it back into a system where it can be um, recycled, reused. It, it's great. So Francesca, let's take a best practice example where circularity comes into focus. Uh, say I support company X because it's producing with circular solutions in mind, uh, then my behavior contributes to a virtuous circle and the circular economy becomes tangible. So what product do you think of when, when I mention um, a best practice example like this? Well, there, there are many examples out there that you can think of. Uh, if I try to relate to something, again, that we do, uh, all of us do uh, regularly, go to the supermarket and buy uh, a bottle of shampoo or detergent, there are more and more solutions uh, that allow you to have, uh, uh, let's say, a, um, a reusable packaging solution that you can keep at home. Uh, and then next time you go to the supermarket, you will just purchase every fill. Uh, so you still have some level of packaging, but clearly uh, much less that if every time, you know, you were to buy the solid uh, rigid container uh, and uh, and the refill pouch more and more also, they can be recycled uh, thanks to innovation and recycling processes as well. Uh, how exactly have circular business models emerged and developed in recent years? Has it, has it been... Um, a push or a pull model. Uh, you've mentioned that there's 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 good European level legislation that has, I think, pushed industry in the right direction. But is there are consumers pulling it as well? Uh, tell us about how these circular business models um, have emerged and developed. Yes, I would say clearly, you know, this, the demand side is there, right? So we're just saying that the, the consumer clearly a, a big lever, become an increasingly big lever uh, for for that demand for change, right? They are demanding change, um, which is good, um, and 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 that's big part of you know this uh, this transformation as well. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, the legislature, of course, uh, uh, has done its part, is doing its part, uh, but. I don't like too much this image that industry is just sitting there waiting for someone to tell them what to do and do the right things. I think that's really, you know, a bit of a distort image of industry. Of course, business uh, uh, need to be, you know, sustainable also financially. But I think in today's world, um, companies understand that contributing to circular economy for them is an ethical and also is a competitive imperative. Uh, and I think these two things are really important to understand, right? So they understand they need to contribute to the change as part of what it is expected today, right? From go to corporate social responsibility, you are uh, a player in this society and it is expected to you to deliver and behave in a certain way. And I think companies uh, are uh, now understanding that very well. Um, of course, you know, improvement is always is always there. But again, innovation then, when we talk about competitive uh, side of things, it's so important. You're not staying on the market if you're not uh, innovating and if you don't find new solutions, right? So 
I, I really like you know to perhaps deliver that as a message that it's important for the legislator not just to tell industry and impose target but to work with industry as well as with the other stakeholders with the NGOs and and really understand how do we get there together right so, uh, I really like this idea of you know it is a dialogue uh, with the different parts with the different stakeholders I I hope you know we can ditch the image of like us and then. Uh, that would not deliver the result. That would deliver poor policy choices that don't really look at the different uh, aspects that need to be taken into account. That will alienate consumers if you give them solutions that then don't satisfy. Because, yes, of course, everybody says, do you want to do contribute to the environment? Everybody answers yes. But then you have to make things practical for them, convenient, uh, and still allow them to have the lifestyle that I think they, they would like to live. Okay, so let's say uh, the dialogue is working, there is progress, and let's go to an even higher level now. Uh, can you point to any best practice cities or, or even best practice countries where they're actually really genuinely putting circular solutions into practice? Of course, we all immediately think Scandinavia because they're always getting the best grades on the report card. But what examples spring to your mind? Well, yes, I mean, when you say everybody, you know, thinks can I think there are many examples around Europe would be even hard to pick one. Uh, I'm Italian and you, most of you perhaps will be surprised to hear that uh, when it comes to recycling uh, in Italy, the, we are really doing incredibly well. Uh, of course, there are, you know, some local issues that then make the news. Uh, but so I think, you know, at the level of both the municipalities of the countries, uh, we do see um, we do see lots of new uh, actions being taken. Uh, but then, you know, I really like perhaps to reconduct it to Europe, right? So uh, I, w I think one of the biggest uh, steps that has been taken at the European level has been the adoption of uh, the Circular Economy Action Plan. Uh, so a big policy um, uh, communication that set the direction of travel on how do you know what do we need, uh, which direction are we moving, and what are the different elements we we need to achieve that. And for example, revising the packaging and packaging waste legislation in Europe is one of those elements. Uh, and so is also uh, the um, uh, regulation, uh, uh, the new proposed regulation on the eco design of products. Uh, so that. You know, these are very concrete tools that we are basically keeping ourselves with in order to uh, to lead this transformation. And, uh, um, you know, we just discussed very practically the example of uh, the digital tools as well as a way to make it that even more, you know, a very easy reality to apply in our daily lives. I just wanted to say I can back you up on, on progress in Italy. Um, I was recently in Sardinia and stayed at a place um, where I received a tutorial from the from the woman who was managing it, um, and it was a hilarious episode to to, to witness because um, b between our language differences, she explained in great detail how to separate things properly. Um, I really could have used a digital solution, um, but after thirty minutes or so, I got it, um, and I was very impressed uh, at, at at how the the separation system worked because it was super effective, and I was very happy to know that uh, a beautiful place like uh, Sardinia was being preserved because people really do put the rules into practice there um, and, and, and keep Sardinia beautiful. So I just wanted to say, yes, it is working in, um, in, in parts of Italy. Um, but I should also point out that we're focusing on Europe so far in this podcast. Uh, Europe as a plastics producer is, of course, a significant player, but Europe still trails behind places like China, like North America, and, and what is known as a rest of Asia grouping. So can change led by Europe lead to real change and real progress if it's just Europe? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question because, um, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the size, you know, of our economy, the European economy, that is a huge leverage, right? That gives us huge leverage uh, in uh, setting the direction of change at a global level. Um, over the years, right, we, we can take the example of uh, regulatory standards. Uh, when Europe sets standards, 
um, then these are often adopted as the global standard. Why? Because you know these uh, international partners want to have access to our markets and uh, you know uh, our um, 450 million, 500 million consumers. Uh, so that in itself is a very powerful uh, uh, tool that uh, that Europe has uh, to let's say be the initiator and the driver of change. Uh, but we will be able then to convince others to follow us and that you know has come often as a question for example in relation to climate change um, and uh, some of the tools that Europe has, uh, uh, has adopted uh, to, uh, to address an issue which you know you can't have a more global issue than climate change and our contribution in a negative way to, to the problem uh, or then solutions uh, um, is minimum in scale right to some of the partners that uh, global partners that you mentioned so how can we do that? I think we can only do that if we prove that we have the solutions that allow the change to be economically viable. So if we can prove that, yeah, that the solutions are, uh, you know, implementable in practice, uh, um, the consumers, you know, can follow us and also then uh, the company's uh, competitiveness uh, doesn't suffer as a result of it in terms of they are unable then to compete on the international market. I think that's the key, right? Show that, yes, we can do it and you know what, we can do it and still remain competitive and in fact gain a competitive edge. Uh, because we've gone in this direction. And, and that's where we go back to the discussion, you know, how do we deliver change? And we look at the different uh, trade-offs, potential trade-offs, how we're assessing them, how we're taking action to minimize them uh, and making sure that uh, uh, we, you know, don't have to degrow, essentially, as we were saying before. So what are the hottest current trends? Uh, what are some examples of how circularity is actually being implemented? Yeah, if you allow me, uh, just on the digital part, uh, I wanted to mention as well that uh, when it comes also to recycling, uh, we see some uh, uh, new trends uh, which are very promising and very important. Uh, for example, is uh, the use of uh, uh, digital watermarks as a project, for example, uh, called Holy Grail. Uh, that is exploring uh, uh, and already testing out, in fact, at the industrial level, uh, uh, the use of uh, invisible, essentially, marking on the packaging to make sure that when it goes for a sorting facility, uh, then it is properly uh, recognized and directed towards uh, the right uh, waste streams for, uh, for recycling. So that can be really deliver a massive improvement in terms of uh, uh, bringing the material back into the loop and avoiding that uh, uh, some get lost in the, in the process. And just a teaser to our audience, we will have uh, uh, much more coming up on Holy Grail in another episode, so stand by for that. Uh, but let me ask you about another hot trend, and maybe we can cast our net a bit wider uh, away from packaging specifically. Um, is there any other industry or sector that, that, that comes to mind, for, like the fashion industry, for example? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are seeing many sectors adopting uh, new models, circular models, uh, new ideas coming up. Uh, certainly, uh, textile and fashion industry is uh, uh, one where we see this change happening. Uh, there are um, also big um, names of uh, uh, the fashion retailing industry that have adopted or introduced in, uh, uh, take back schemes, uh, which means that uh, when you buy uh, their, their clothes uh, and uh, you can eventually then take them back to the shop, uh, depending on the conditions, they might be put up for resale. Um, or uh, if they are not in so good condition, uh, they will at least then uh, be put through uh, a textile recycling schemes. So you know, again, we avoid the creation of waste that is, uh, that is not recycled and even better potentially clothes that are reused. So now, Francesca, let me ask you, what is the specific vision of Europan? What are the goals? And, and, and looking as far out into the future as you wish, what's the timeline to reach those goals? Well, the vision for us, I'd say it's simple. Um, so packaging should be treated as a valuable resource uh, moving forward. Uh, and it can no longer be treated as waste uh, uh, that serves no further purpose. Uh, we, we want the material back, is a valuable resource uh, that prevents depletion and use of additional new natural resources. Uh, um, and this is why uh, we think the, the ongoing uh, revision of the biggest piece of legislation uh, that uh, uh, is happening today at European level, uh, the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive uh, uh, revision, is very important uh, because uh, it really can help uh, to scale up the level of ambition 
and make sure that uh, uh, packaging circularity really becomes a reality. Uh, so we're very supportive of that. The, the timeline that is being considered currently by, uh, by the legislator is 2030, uh, but uh, many of our members uh, are already, have already set goals which are ahead of that uh, um, uh, with 2025 deadline, for example, in, uh, in mind. Um, so the targets, as I said, are important, uh, but for, for our vision, what we also think it's essential uh, is setting these framework conditions. Uh, so uh, how do we get there? And uh, for this, I mentioned earlier, uh, really the need for a systemic change, uh, which involves uh, a greater investment uh, also into the development of the waste management infrastructures. Uh, separate waste, co waste collection uh, systems, and, and also we discuss you know, the essential role of, uh, of the consumers uh, in helping delivering the change. So it sounds like we're ahead of schedule on some parts of the, the, the chain, and, and, and there are other links in the chain where there's still room for improvement. Um, my big question to you now is, when will we know if we have succeeded or failed? Will it become clear at any specific point, or is that is that also um, a, a, a work in progress? Well, I think, you know, as I said, I think we are on a good track. Um, so clearly the direction of travel, I think, is set, uh, and there is no going back. Uh, so I think that is that is well understood. Uh, million dollar question when we will know if we've succeeded I guess it's uh, yeah, when we see that we're all moving really in the same direction right and uh, we have overcome the concern uh, we have uh, overcome the doubts uh, the resistance uh, uh, and again I think for that we really need to make sure that what is defined is implementable is clear to understand easy to implement especially for the consumers uh, and we have, you know, concrete solution that work both for industry and for for the citizens. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's it's hard to to give you anything more specific. But I think at least that should be what we should aim towards to know that we are moving towards success. Thank you very much to Francesca Siciliano Stevens for giving us so much insight into the circular economy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you all enjoyed listening to this episode. And again, if you listened to the podcast and want to watch the conversation with Francesca, head over to OMV's YouTube channel. Or if you have feedback for us or questions, please write an email to podcast at omv.com. We would love to hear from you. For more background information on the circular economy, Head over and check out our show notes where you will find links to lots of valuable information. That will do it for us this time around. We hope you will join us again for the next episode of Rethinking Resources.